Okay. Hello, everybody. This is Hannah here from Vitality Cycles. Today, I'm with the lovely Dr. Daniels, and she is going to be talking about a very exciting subject for us today, which is promising blood tests for the diagnosis of fibromyalgia, new health breakthrough, and why you should ignore it. Are you guys ready? Here we go, Dr. Daniels. We're ready for you. Okay, hello. Alrighty. So, uh, one thing is difficult that people have shared with me is how do you analyze information, right? How do you take a look at information and decide what is going on here? Okay. So, we have something called fibromyalgia, and you have the link there to the article. And in the article, it tells you 4 million people have fibromyalgia. Um, uh, and these people, we're going to guess, are over 18. Every now and then you have to make assumptions because the article doesn't give you information. So in order to figure this out, what you have to understand is if this test comes back positive, what does it mean? What are the chances that you have whatever it's testing for? In this case, it's fibromyalgia. So um, I'm going to walk you through the whole thing. And you should walk through this yourself with every single anything test that they give you. Now notice, we don't have all the information that we need here to figure this out. They tell us that 4 million people have fibromyalgia, that's great. But of these 4 million, these 4 million are US citizens. And the United States has 332 million people over the age of 18. So now we have a numerator of 4 million and denominator 332 million. That's important. So a lot of times in articles like this, they'll give you a numerator, but not a denominator. And you have to realize that that's what they're doing. Okay, so what we do is we take one, oh, 94% accurate. So we take one minus 0.94. That's easy, but why is it 0.94? Because it says percent, that means per 100, so you divide it by 100.94. One minus that, okay, fine. And then we multiply that by 332.94. Nine million. But wait, what does that tell us? That tells us how many test results will be false. If we test all these 332 million people, we're going to get 19.7 million false test results. All right. But wait, the people who have, let's give the test the benefit of the doubt and say that all 4 million people with fibromyalgia were detected. They're all detected. Accurate. Okay. So that means that of the wrong test results, there are people that did not have fibromyalgia. In other words, that five people get labeled as having fibromyalgia when actually they don't have it. So this test uh, has the effect of increasing fibromyalgia revenue mm -hmm. by Imagine you're a car dealer and all you have to do is administer a test to everyone that walks in and your test will explode by five times. Mm -hmm. And the five times explosion, you don't even need to hand them a car. Wow. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Yeah, <laughs> awesome. That is really, and fibromyalgia, what is that? That seems like such a broad term that they're kind of throwing around for people with Bingo. Simple. Bingo. What it's is exactly it? What it sounds like. So if you have basically aches and pains all over your body, let's say we're sitting right here, perfectly still, doing nothing, and you have fibromyalgia, or I do. I won't have any pain, but let me move any part of my body. Ouch, it hurts. Ouch, it hurts. Oh, it hurts everywhere. Oh. It's a very annoying, troublesome situation, right? And most mm -hmm. people would pay just about anything. Uh, to get rid of it. Okay, so we've got a situation where five of every six people, you have six people, five of every six that you treat, they just don't even have the condition. So mm -hmm. this is, this is uh, shocking, <laughs> I think. So what does the NIH have to say about this? First of all, since I'm with the medical school, I can tell you, you never create a test unless you have a drug to sell for the disease. So mm. we go to the National Institute of Health 
or we Google, actually you can Google this, um, new drugs for the condition they're testing for. And, oh, oh my gosh. <laughs> so here we are, this is PubMed Central, National Library of Medicine, put out by your government, you know, in the United States, nothing to do with me, I didn't write this. Holy smoly, current and emerging pharmacotherapy for fibromyalgia. Uh, we can skip the blah, 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 but uh, what I like is the bottom line. Uh, okay, the strikingly modest progress in this field, that means the existing drugs don't work, <clears throat> have manifested by the low compliance of patients. Patients are not obedient, they're not taking the drugs. Why are they not take a drug? They don't work. Attest the great complexity of the mechanisms of chronic pain to the central nervous system. No, it's too complicated. We don't understand. So we are at the we are at the at the beginning, and so uh, they have a list of drugs. Holy cow! Let me just go through them. Amitriptyline. This is a very old uh, antidepressant, the tricyclic class. If it doesn't kill you, it'll make you go on to commit suicide and kill yourself. Duloxetine, a little more modern. Milnacipram, rebeloxetine, astro estraboxetine, citalopram, oh my gosh, fluoxetine, paroxetine. These are all SSRI, serotonin reuptake inhibitors. It moves you to homicide or suicide, flip the coin, who cares which one. Either one is bad, right? Cyclobenzaprine, these are all old drugs looking for a new job. Get a pendant, they're trying to get that off the market because it's so dangerous and ineffective, but hey, they're giving it. And Lacosamide, naltrexone, what? You're not even, not even a heroin addict, right? Tr tramadol, <laughs> which is an opioid. <laughs> Nabilone, dronabilone, you get ketamine. It, it, the list is, is endless. And so another thing too about a drug, it's the more, the more uh, drugs they have for it, the less effective obviously it is. Mm. But I'm looking for the summary paragraph here because that is, where it the deal is so the deal is they have three new drugs um, on the horizon and they have therapies that would just knock your socks off um oh here we are real life data published over recent years together with the clinical experience of doctors dealing with this group of patients all indicate that only a very small number of patients continue taking medications for more than a short period of time due to lack of efficacy efficacy those doesn't work side effects are both current guidelines published regarding the treatment of fibromyalgia unanimously advocate a multidisciplinary approach combining drugs complementary modalities including behavioral therapy that's a psychiatrist aerobic strengthening physical training and even meditative movement therapies so they're saying is look we're willing to invite the alternative therapy people in as we are all doing something that just doesn't work mm -hmm. so whenever you have a medicine medical breakthrough especially if it's a new test and a screening test you can bet your bippy that if it's positive your probability of actually having the disease is low like less than 50 percent in this case, your chance of having a disease is actually 16%. So you have a test that's 94% effective or accurate, but because the disease is so rare, affects such a small number of people, the actual uh, positive predictive value, your chances of having the disease, if the test is positive, is only 16%. Wow. In other words, an 84% chance that you don't have the disease. So if the test is negative, yeah. there's a 100% chance you don't have it. And if it's positive, there's an 84% chance you don't have the disease. Oh, my goodness. Exactly. <laughs> you can just cover your arm. Don't even let them poke the needle in there. Just say goodbye. I'm sorry. I left the pot on the stove. I have to go check it. <laughs> oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, uh so that's the story. And so you, you've got to, what I would say to people is any new medical breakthrough, just ignore it. Those of you who've got to really dig in there, uh, one minus the effectiveness. So if they say it's 99.9999995 effective, then mm -hmm. it's one minus point 
you have to divide, move that decimal point, point. So it's nine 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 five. So subtract that, and then multiply by the number of people being tested. In this case, maybe the population of the United States, or I was generous. I only counted people who were over 18. This number would be even bigger if we let them test people under 18, which of course they will probably try to do once they get the test. Right. But, uh, so multiply it by the, by the population being tested. And that gives you a hard number of how many people are gonna get a positive test. And then usually the article will tell you how many people are affected or what percent of people who are affected. And you simply take a ratio of that and there you have it. And this ratio is actually a good ratio, 16%. I've done this for tests and found that um, the probability of you having a disease is actually less than 4% mm -hmm. if the test says, yes, you have it. Wow. Yeah. So if people will just not, all screening, every, every last piece of screening, don't do it. <laughs> Don't do it. Because, yeah, if you, whether it's your colonoscopy, your mammogram, they all have a lower probability than this. Wow. So if you get a mammogram that's positive, the chances that you actually have cancer are far less than 16%. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if you have a colonoscopy um, where they have fine polyps, they're taking polyps out, or even they find a cancer, your chances of that cancer ever becoming a problem in your lifetime, again, less than 16%. And this is why screening exams are such amazing moneymaker. Yeah. Now, let's figure something else out. Here's something to <clears throat> knock your socks off. Let's say you're a testing laboratory, and this accuracy is 94%. Because the actual number of people who have this disease is far less than that, 94, um, less than the, the remaining 6% error. If you generate a test that gave 100% negative results, it would be more accurate than this test being used. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Fascinating, isn't it? Very Don't fast. Test the blood. Just, just draw the blood for drama, charge the money, throw it out the window, give a negative test result, and your accuracy will be higher than uh, had you actually run the test. Mm -hmm. So you have to ask yourself, why run the test? Oh, oh, oh. You have to run the test because obviously those false positives are what generates the millions, billions, and trillions. Right. So if you are, as a lab, figure out the statistical situation, that your results will be more accurate if you just give everyone a negative test result, you will quickly be detected and shut down because the real purpose of these tests is to funnel people, healthy people, into chemotherapy or into all these drugs that don't work. Right, for sure. And let's say we had someone who felt that they possibly were experiencing the symptoms of fibromyalgia. What would you recommend for them to do as like a natural remedy? And it works 100% of the time. I'm glad you asked. Um, just eat a high collagen diet. That would be pig ears, um, beef tendons, and eat, uh, well, you have fibromyalgia, you're in a lot of pain. Things mm -hmm. to do. I would say definitely eat eight ounces a day. So that's a pre-cooked weight. And you don't just eat just that, right? So make it good. Maybe cook it with some collard greens or some, or some broccoli, whatever. Those things are very hard to cook. You have to pressure cook them for anywhere from one to two hours. But mm -hmm. in my experience, pig ears or um, uh, tendons are really good. Um, you can also use the feet of any animal. Animal that will be cow feet, chicken feet, pig feet. Um, and you'll feel better literally in about three or four days. Now, yeah. not cured, but you'll feel, oh. Noticeable right. improvement. And if you keep eating it, you'll be pain-free. Amazing. I think that's a really good tip for someone who's experiencing pain right now and wants to find that remedy that's going to help them to even just feel a little bit better. Um, what else would you say, like for the other tests, you know, some people feel that they need to go in and get tests done. Like, for example, colonoscopies are so 
um, recommended for people who are experiencing issues. What yeah. would you say? Yeah. yeah. What would you say <laughs> people should do instead? Yeah. Um, again, anything. You'd be better off doing nothing. So yeah. colonoscopy, although all it does is give you information, there yeah. are many, many complications. And if you are a person who is having intestinal problems and you're having pain down there and it's tender, you're actually more likely to get complications from that test wow. than someone else because your bowel is inflamed and painful. And so that means it's weaker. And so the tube will push right through, give you a perforation, and now they have a $20,000 surgery they can earn money on. So again, they know they're going to have a certain number of perforations and complications, and that's where the big profit is. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That is just, you know, we just have no words for something like that, you know. At our age, we call it beyond evil. <laughs> <sighs> okay, so do you have anything else to share about that topic or anything else? It really takes a lot of courage. I can sit here and tell you all the facts. You're like, uh huh, uh huh, uh huh. And then what happens to you is like, oh, no, I have to get tested. Oh, no, no. <laughs> so you got to um, somehow muster the courage to say no or create the incentive. So in my life, what I've done is I don't carry health insurance, right? So if mm -hmm. I decide, oh, I need to get sodomized, I have to ask myself, do I really need to pay three, five, ten thousand dollars $10,000 to get sodomized, right? <laughs> so now I have a bigger dollar barrier where I can say, you know what? Ah, I'll stay home. Yeah. <laughs> because it's not free, right? I'm not going to be limited to my copay, deductible, whatever. Okay, so that's one thing. Don't have health insurance. Next thing is where do you live? Where I live, I can't even imagine. I have to get on a plane at least, I think, to get a colonoscopy. I mean, it would be not easy. So I, I put all kinds of barriers in my way so that I have a lot of, lot of time to reconsider. Yeah. So for me, it's not like I say to my uh, significant other, Oh, honey, I got a pain in my tummy. And he says, oh, we've got insurance. It's the best. Let's go. The hospital's two doors down. <laughs> now, even if somebody wanted to help me, yeah. they would have to get me on a plane in my condition. And the planes don't leave like every 10 minutes, right? They have to get me on a plane, figure out where the plane should fly to, figure out how to get me from the airport <laughs> to whatever the facility is, try right. and get me an appointment. And then, oops. Now we have to pay for this. Oops, cash. <laughs> <laughs> and then how do you reverse it and get me back home? So even yeah. a committed lover might say, hmm. <laughs> or just pause, you know. <laughs> yeah. So he's got to come out of pocket for, it sounds like 5,000 bucks, right? In terms of transfers and this or that. So hmm. what you do is you put barriers. You've got to create barriers for yourself to... Give yourself time to calm down. Give yourself time to go look up that Dr. Daniels episode and listen to it. <laughs> or yeah. whatever it takes, right? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, I think that's that's it from, from <laughs> us. I yeah. mean, this was really great talking to you about this subject. And in the future, I'm we're planning on doing uh, some more videos. And I would love to kind of get everyone's feedback on what they would like to see more of us talking about and um, anything anybody wants to learn about, you can put in the comments below and Dr. Daniels would definitely be more than happy to share her amazing insights with you guys. <laughs>